After more than two years of COVID, we're now looking at recovery uh, in the aviation sector. The demand for travel um, is really high, including here in Singapore as well. Now, you yourself have said that you expect traffic to return to pre-pandemic levels in 2023. Mm -hmm. And that is a year um, ahead of what had been earlier forecast. Now, where is this confidence coming from? Well, I have to say the recovery is much stronger than even I had expected. And I'm an optimist, you know, looking at the industry, I, I felt we would recover once the restrictions on uh, border crossings were relaxed or removed. Uh, but the pace at which the industry is recovering is very, very encouraging. Uh, so um, when we've analyzed all of the various markets, you know, what we see is international travel recovering stronger than expected. The Domestic markets are not as uh, strong as we had originally expected, but that's principally down to China. Uh, and China is a, a, you know, a very big domestic market. So with the Chinese government continuing to pursue zero COVID, it's having a big impact there. Uh, but international markets are strong and uh, accelerating. And I, I think what's also uh, interesting, which came as a surprise to me when I was looking at the data, is that premium travel so these are people traveling in first and business class. That's actually increasing at a faster rate than economy travel. And now that's not an indication of business travel, um, because in fact, what we believe it's uh, an indication of uh, what we call premium leisure. You know, so these are people with disposable income looking for a premium experience and uh, traveling. So it's, it's very encouraging, all of the signs we see at the moment. Mm. So you mentioned China. Let, let, let's talk about that for a bit. Um, mm. When you look at recovery um, globally, the Asia-Pacific sector has not been doing as well yeah. um, compared to, say, the US or Europe and uh, the Middle East as well. Now, why do you think uh, that is the case. It's, it's very much down to government uh, restrictions on travel. Uh, so if I look at 2021, um, Asia Pacific region was only at 7% international travel. And I, I think it's more important to look at international travel because it's the part of the business that has been disrupted by border closures. So it was only at 7% of uh, where we were in 2019. Um, now in the first quarter of this year, the Asia Pacific international travel is at 13%. So it's improving. Uh, but when you compare that to US, Europe, Latin America, which is, you know, they're, they're touching 60%. Uh, and it's, it's solely down to uh, the restrictions and travel that continue to be in place in the region. Uh, and I think that's why uh, you will continue to see it lag the recovery in the rest of the world. Mm. So pre-pandemic, you know, the, uh, this region was flying high, you mm. know, it was uh, being looked at as the biggest air travel market. Do you think, um, you know, Asia can um, recover and can it close the gap? And how long do you reckon that will take? I think it can recover. Um, if, if we're going to look at the, the region in total, you know, China clearly is a, a big part of that. The Chinese domestic market in 2019 was about 10% of all global traffic. You know, so a big market, second only to the US domestic market and growing at significant uh, rates. Um, you know, while the government pursues that zero COVID, that clearly is, is not going to re recover as strongly as other markets. Um, the international within Asia uh, was one of the biggest international markets in the world. In 2019, it was about 13, just over 13% of all travel, uh, international travel. Um, so I think the opportunity for recovery is very strong. And we're beginning now to see more and more countries remove the restrictions that have, in effect, inhibited people from traveling. So I, I'm encouraged. Um, you know, clearly, I would like to see a move in China. Uh, I don't think we're going to see that this year. Uh, but quite honestly, I'm not uh, concerned because it's not really going to impact on the recovery in 22 because I, I think uh, carriers in the region have lots of opportunity to rebuild their networks in, in, in other areas. But going into 2023, if China is still closed, well then I think it will have an impact in 2023, but it, it's not slowing down the recovery this year. Mm, so given that China is such a huge market in Asia, you don't think that the region as a whole 
can um, recover quickly without China, or do you think it can? No, I, I think China is just too big a part yes. of the uh, the market here. So um, if the borders remain closed there, it certainly will uh, slow down the recovery. But I still think there's a lot of positives. You know, there's a lot of ground to make up. Um, with the uh, region only at 13% in the first quarter of this year. And it is accelerating significantly from everything we've heard, you know, both from uh, uh, Singapore and from uh, Changi Airport. You know, they're very encouraged with what they're, uh, they're seeing at the moment. Is IATA engaging China in any way? Are you a part of this, uh, you know, uh, push? hopefully to get China to open up yeah, a bit we, more. We, we continue to encourage governments everywhere to base their decisions on the scientific evidence, the data that's uh, available. Uh, China has been an outlier from the very beginning. Um, and you know, they're, they're probably the only country that continues to persist with a zero COVID approach. Many others tried that initially. And in fact, if you remember, many were very successful in the early period, but now realize that uh, it's not sustainable to keep their borders closed. Um, but uh, you know, China will do what China wants to do and uh, will watch with great interest and have, uh, you know, I think, hopes for the future uh, because uh, you know, everybody has seen China as an important strategic market and will continue to do so. Uh, but as I said, there are other opportunities for growth uh, in the region and outside of the region. And I think airlines will, will pursue those opportunities while keeping an eye on uh, China and uh, hope to you know, be able to recover their position there. I think apart from China, the other country that had been a bit slow, perhaps before this, was Japan. Yeah. But um, you know, they've made some announcements on that. Do you? How, how do you view the that? Yeah, I, I think Japan is now beginning to go in the right direction. I, I think the government there could be more ambitious, could take bolder decisions. Uh, I've always been really impressed with the success of the Japanese government in improving uh, and focusing on tourism. You know, they they've uh, done a great job. Um, portraying uh, and successfully developing Japan as a tourist destination. Uh, we had the Rugby World Cup, fantastic success. Uh, you know, everybody who attended that really impressed with what they saw. Uh, I, I think it was a huge disappointment that the Olympics took place behind closed doors. You know, that was a, a great opportunity for uh, Japan. Um, but they're now beginning to slowly change and reopen. And uh, I think that's a, that's a positive development. I, I would see, Japan being about nine months behind where Singapore is. So um, I hope it doesn't take nine months to catch up. Uh, but if I look at where Singapore was nine months ago, that's, that's where I see Japan today. So do you think Singapore has made a good recovery? I mean, you, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, nine months. Yeah. If you look at um, Changi Airport and if you look at Singapore Airlines, hmm. Do you think they've made um, good progress and good recovery? I, I, I think they have. Uh, what has always impressed me about Singapore right throughout this two year period has been, uh, you know, they were, they were always expressing a desire to reopen. Um, you know, when other countries were sort of making a feature of the fact that they were locked down, Singapore was always looking for the opportunity to reopen and tried and tested uh, a number of options. So, you know, the ambition here was always how quickly can we get back to pre-pandemic levels. And I think uh, the recovery will be very strong here, certainly from uh, the figures uh, I've seen at uh, Changi Airport, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged. So uh, I think uh, Singapore has done a, a good job. I think the government here um, is helping now. Uh, the fact that we're holding this conference at this time, I think is an indication of the support that the government has for uh, getting Changi back on the map as a global hub airport and Singapore Airlines I think have done a, a fantastic job. Um, you know, when you consider, uh, I, I, I listened uh, yesterday to uh, um, uh, Chumpong uh, speaking about the, the challenge they had, you know, when their traffic in effect collapsed to nothing. Uh, you know, to be able to keep the business going, I think has been a fantastic achievement. They've taken all of the right decisions, they're positioned very well uh, to strongly recover, and I would expect them to do so. I think the big announcement for us yesterday probably was when Minister Ishwaran uh, said that works were going to be restarted on yeah. Terminal 5, which yeah. is a huge expansion for Singapore and for the air hub. Yeah. Um, so I think some positive news. Yeah, uh, from and, and that that's, as well. that, that's why I say I think Singapore was always looking to the future uh, and spoke positively.
positively. That, that set them apart from a lot of other countries. Uh, and it was very helpful for us to be able to you know, point to Singapore as an example of what other countries could do. Uh, so the speed of response in the region from Singapore has been uh, very positive. But you know, post uh, pandemic, do you think that airlines and airports have to sort of rethink how they do things, how they operate? Mm. We didn't get very many details yesterday, but uh, you know, it was alluded to that uh, there was going to be some sort of redesign, rethinking for Terminal 5. So how do you think the, the industry needs to move going forward? Well, it, it's, you know, our industry is incredibly resilient and very flexible and always looking to new ways of operating to improving how we can serve our, our customers. I think one of the things that has come across strongly in the past two years is digital transformation and the opportunity to transform the airport and airline experience uh, using uh, digital technology in a better way. The technology exists, we know that, we've talked about it for many years, but to make that process through the airport before you travel, you know, when you arrive, to make all of that smoother using technology, I think is a great opportunity. And that, that's where Singapore, I think, can excel um, because there is ambition. Uh, I, I think the whole system is better integrated here, the relationship between the government, the airport, the airline, uh, to achieve change like that is a, a real opportunity. So it will be interesting to see. I've, I've not had any um, discussions about specific issues that they intend to look at, but I think there is a real opportunity for uh, Singapore to transform the customer experience at uh, Terminal 5. So, you know, when we talk about the future of travel, um, can you sort of like, you know, kind of like walk us through the experience, say, you know, travellers can expect, uh, you know, I don't know, two, three, five years from now? We've always been looking to try and make that process through the airport uh, a lot easier for people. Um, one of the things that disappointed us through this pandemic was uh, we, we almost reverted to paper processing uh, when we have been moving forward with uh, you know, digital transformation, the customer transacting with the airline and the airport using their mobile phone uh, and mobile technology. I, I think that is going to be the future. Um, you know, there's, there's no need for us to have to do all the processing that we do. Uh, technology exists to be able to make it much easier for the customer, both departing uh, and then arriving, particularly the arrival process where uh, immigration authorities can have all of the information in advance of the customer arriving. And, we, and we've seen some of that uh, through this pandemic. The problem during the pandemic is it was largely uh, you know, manual processes and paper-based, uh, but I think there's an opportunity to transform that. Uh, we've always, as an industry, wanted to make it easier. It's in our interest to do so. It's in the interest of the airport to do so. What the airport's like is to get the customer through that initial uh, processing phase at the check-in desk so they can get airside and spend money in the shops. You know, that's what airports love to see. Lots of uh, customers smiling, getting great bargains uh, in the uh, duty-free shopping. And, and to be fair, it's what airlines want to see as well because it helps to keep the cost of the, uh, uh, the airports down for us. So uh, I think there is a real opportunity to improve that. I want to take you back to what you said earlier. You talked about premium leisure. Yeah. Uh, that's something I think not very much heard of pre-pandemic. And I would imagine it's because people now have a lot more disposable income. Mm -hmm. Do you expect this trend to stay or do you think it's just something uh, temporary? No, I, I think it's a permanent uh, feature of the industry. Um, it's something that I used to look at when I was uh, CEO at British Airways and IAG. It was a very important segment of our business, particularly at British Airways. Uh, so, um, you know, if we looked at people traveling in the premium classes, the majority of those people were people traveling uh, on leisure. They weren't business people. I think the perception has always been that if you're traveling in business class or first, you're traveling on business. And what we've seen previously is that that segment of the market is robust through economic cycles as well. So it has been an important uh, part of the business, and I think will become increasingly so. It's one of the reasons you see uh, quite a number of airlines now looking at a, a premium economy cabin mm -hmm. uh, as well. So, you know, four cabins on the aircraft, you know, first class, business class, premium economy, economy, because people do have disposable income. You know, they want to be able to choose the experience that they have, and people are uh, prepared to pay a premium for a premium service. So I think it's a permanent feature. 
Uh, I think you'll see more and more airlines focus on it as an opportunity. And as I said, it's been encouraging um, for us to see that that segment has been uh, increasing and recovering faster than the uh, economy segment. So that sounds like good news for premium carriers like Singapore Airlines. Definitely. I'm just wondering though, so again, pre-pandemic budget carriers were quite a, a, a problem, if I may use that word, for mm -hmm. legacy carriers. Do you think that budget airlines are ever going to make a comeback or oh, do you yeah, think no, those days no, are gone? Yeah, no, no, without question. There's plenty of room in this uh, business, in, in the industry for um, both uh, budget carriers and uh, premium, uh, you know, traditional what people sometimes refer to as legacy carriers. You know, th there's no single business model that works. There are many different types and without question, uh, there's a, a lot of opportunity for budget carriers and we will see significant growth in that segment of the market as well. But for um, carriers like uh, Singapore, uh, you know, th that premium leisure market I think is, is a real opportunity. And uh, for me, um, you know, it's been a robust segment uh, for as long as I've been sort of looking at that and, and I think it will continue to be so. So I think while the recovery has been great for travellers and, you know, we are seeing a lot of pent up demand, yeah. um, there's also a sense that fares have been climbing uh, quite significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the cost that travellers, uh, you know, are, are paying? I think fares have increased for, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, you know, supply and demand. Uh, the, the demand is strong and uh, supply, uh, although it's increasing, uh, you know, the airlines are taking time because they have to, to re rebuild their networks. So uh, not all of the options uh, that were available in 2019 are available today. That, 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 will, that will return. But the other major factor is the price of oil. Uh, so uh, fuel is the single biggest cost of uh, an airline. If I look across the industry um, and take uh, the 10 years between 2010 and 2019 as being representative of a sort of a normal uh, economic cycle, uh, the uh, fuel costs were 27%, represented 27% of an airline's cost base on average. Some it's higher, uh, some it's lower, but on average 27%. And that was with fuel at uh, $80 a barrel, Brent at $80 a barrel. You know, today it's over $110 a barrel. Uh, and more significantly, there's a, a big premium for jet fuel. Um, I think that's temporary because of the, uh, the amount of refining that was shut down uh, because there wasn't demand for uh, jets. Uh, but that hopefully will improve. So, uh, you know, once the cost of fuel goes up, it's inevitable that that will find its way uh, to the consumer in the form of higher fares, uh, particularly in an environment like this where, uh, you know, airline financial uh, strength has been significantly weakened as a result of the pandemic. So I've been saying for some time that with a high oil price, it's inevitable that fares will increase. But, you know, there was a time when airlines uh, used to impose a fuel surcharge. Yeah. And I think that uh, gave uh, some uh, clarity as far as travellers concerned because when fuel prices came down that yeah. component would be removed yeah. why is the industry not doing that now yeah i think some airlines are it, it's not as easy uh, as you might think um, customers actually didn't really like the surcharge you know uh, and a number of airlines made a feature of the fact that they they weren't charging fuel surcharges uh, so it got a little bit of a bad reputation it, it was a significant part of the industry between 2006 and maybe 2011, um, and there was constant coverage around uh, fuel surcharges. You don't see the same debate now, but some airlines do have you know, structured fuel surcharging that reflects the uh, change in the uh, oil price. You may see that uh, returning, but I, I think uh, the industry has moved on and now is embedding that uh, oil price in the general uh, price of the tickets. But you know, I, I wouldn't rule out surcharging um, being a feature going forward as well. So while the recovery is good news um, overall for uh, airlines and for airports and for travellers, um, the virus is still very much still here. And we're now talking about new sub-variants of Omicron. We have the BA.4 uh, and the BA.5. Mm -hmm. Now, are you concerned that, you know, um, if this becomes worse, that it may derail uh, some of the plans that the sector has for recovery? No, I, I don't think so. I, th I think we've learned a lot as we've gone through the two years. What is important is that, uh, you know, we believe 
decisions should be based on scientific evidence and data, and there is a lot of data. I can understand and I can sympathize with governments imposing the restrictions that they did in early 2020 when this virus uh, you know, first appeared, um, because we were dealing with an unknown risk. You know, people didn't know how um, medical systems would cope, how health systems in, in countries would cope. It's very different now. You, you know, the initial fear that health systems would be overrun because of the number of people in, infected, that I think has largely abated. Not completely, but largely abated. And that's why we see in, in many parts of the world, restrictions have been removed, even though infections are still there, and in some cases, infections rising, mm -hmm. because the health risk has uh, reduced. So um, I, I'm optimistic that you know, governments will have learned from what was done well and what was done badly over the past two years. But we have a lot of rich data now available to us which should help governments to make more informed decisions and deal with the, the, the risks that are um, uh, there as, as a result of the virus in a better way. But you know, much of the data has only been available recently, I think in recent months perhaps, but IATA has been pushing for, um, you know, uh, removing restrictions from, yeah. I think, over a year ago. Now, was that based, uh, you know, on scientific data? It was, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, because we had a lot of data available in, in uh, some countries, not in every country. Uh, the UK, for example, um, published very rich data on uh, what was happening in the UK, uh, both for people based in the UK, but more importantly, people arriving in the UK. Uh, so there was uh, very significant data sets available there where you could analyze what was happening with the virus. And more importantly, you could model the impact of somebody coming into the country with the virus. And in, in, in reality, many of these border measures, closures, took place after the, the virus was in the country uh, and proved to be completely ineffective. Uh, so you, using that data to model what had happened, what was likely to happen, and what might happen in the future, I think is very important. And uh, you know, we've been looking at it consistently uh, and uh, getting experts to analyze it, looking at various different uh, options, using uh, risk modeling that we have in the industry and adapting our normal risk uh, modeling um, uh, procedures to uh, see you know, what it is we could do with uh, you know, a pandemic as well. So I'm confident that we can make more informed decisions and deal with any future variant or a new virus, deal with it in a better way. Okay, let's talk about masks on flights. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some movements in the, uh, in the US and in, um, in the EU. Yeah. Uh, do you expect more regions to you know, follow suit and to uh, remove the requirement for masks on flights? Yeah, I think um, where mask mandates are removed generally. In other words, if you don't have to wear a mask indoors, if you don't have to wear a mask on a train, you shouldn't have to wear a mask on an airplane. Uh, the environment on an airplane is safer than you know, in this room or in a train, on a bus, in a car. Uh, and that's the issue that we've had. You know, we've said you, you know, there's no reason to treat aviation in a separate way. Um, the air on board the aircraft is filtered, it's refreshed every two minutes. It's actually a safer environment than most other uh, environments you'll be operating in. So what we've said is that if you're not required to wear a mask in other forms of transport, you shouldn't be required to wear a mask on an airplane. It should be down to personal choice. You know, if you wish to wear a mask, fine. Uh, but there, there's no scientific evidence to suggest that you know, a mask is needed on an airplane but not needed on other forms of transport. So why do you think regulators have not been quicker to remove the mandate for masks on flights? Yeah, I, I, in my experience, regulators are quick to introduce measures uh, but slow to remove them. And it's mainly because their risk appetite is very low. Um, you know, particularly politicians, they, they don't like making decisions where they might be criticized subsequently. Uh, you know, we deal in our industry with risk every day. It, it's, it's in our nature to be able to assess risk. And we're all the time doing it. We, you know, we don't just do it on the 1st of January and then wait for next year to do it again. We do it every hour of every day. So we're, you know, we're comfortable making decisions uh, you know, based on the data that we have, uh, assessing the risk. And it's always important that when the circumstances change, you have to reevaluate what the risk is and ensure that the, the measures you have in place are appropriate to the, uh, the risk that you're facing. But when the risk reduces, um, you, know, you, you should take measures to remove the, uh, the actions that you put in place to, to deal with it. But regulators tend to be slow um, 
doing that. It's, it's just in their nature. Right. And, you know, even as the uh, industry uh, recovers from this pandemic, there's this other huge thing called sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether you could just, uh, you know, tell us a bit more about where um, the sector is and, um, you know, should we expect some developments, uh, you know, later on in this year? So our, our industry has always been focused on uh, environmental issues, particularly CO2. And it's been in our interest to do so because fuel being our single biggest cost, you know, anything that we can do to reduce our fuel burn and fuel usage is financially uh, beneficial to us, but also environmentally. Uh, so, you know, there's a direct correlation. For every ton of kerosene that we use, we produce just over three tons of CO2, 3.16 tons of CO2. So it's not something new for us. Um, it's been something that the industry has been very focused on for many years. You know, I've, I'm in the industry 42 years, uh, 43 years this year. Um, you know, I've been well used to that in, in my former role as a pilot. Uh, you know, we were always looking to operate the aircraft in the most efficient way possible. I, I'm really pleased that the industry has come together to uh, target net zero in 2050. I think that's important. So we've aligned ourselves with the goals of the Paris Agreement. We've al aligned ourselves with the ambitions of most countries to achieve net zero in 2050. Doing that is going to be a challenge. Um, but, you know, we have a credible path to achieving it. Uh, principally based on the use of sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and I think this is a, a real opportunity for countries and governments. Singapore in particular has uh, seen that as an opportunity. Uh, you've got Neste based here uh, with uh, ambitions to produce significant quantities of sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, you know, the technology is proven. This, this isn't new. Uh, it's, it's not a, uh, you know, something that's just appeared. It's been around for years and the industry has been trialing sustainable uh, fuels for about 15 years now. Uh, what we need to see is significant scaling up of the production of sustainable fuels. And if you look at last year, um, we use every single drop of available sustainable fuels, despite the fact that it costs, last year on average it was about three times the price of uh, kerosene, jet kerosene. Um, that premium has come down, mainly because kerosene has increased in price. Uh, so, um, Keris, uh, jet um, is about 1,200 US dollars a ton, uh, sustainable fuels today about $3,000 a ton, uh, and yet airlines are using it um, and committing to buy significant quantities going forward. So again, when it comes to sustainability, do you think that um, carriers in the Asia-Pacific are you know, not doing as much or not moving as quickly as airlines, you know, no, uh, the rest no, of the world. No, actually, they, they've, uh, you know, they've made huge progress uh, in a very short period of time. You, you might have argued that, you know, a year ago that they weren't uh, aligned with the, the global industry. I, I think that would be unfair to say that today. In fact, uh, I see a very, very strong commitment from carriers in this region. And, uh, you know, the, most of the carriers individually were looking at net zero in 2050 before collectively uh, we agreed that as a target for the industry. So I think the industry here has uh, moved forward uh, at pace. Singapore has always been a leader in this uh, area. Um, so it's uh, invested quite a lot in um, research and development into sustainability, particularly in the area of sustainable fuels. Okay, um, 43 years in the industry, you've done it all. You started as a pilot yeah. at Aer Lingus, went on to become CEO of the airline, moved to British Airways, and now you're at IATA. Which has been the most challenging role for you so far? I have to be honest, uh, you're running an airline is extremely challenging. Um, you know, much more challenging than running uh, an, an association like IATA uh, because the complexity is just incredible and changes every day. Um, it's a fantastic industry. Uh, you know, I loved my time in the industry. Um, it had come, for me, it was time to retire and move on. I, I had never expected to do this role in IATA, but I'm delighted to be back and involved in the industry and helping my uh, former competitors and some colleagues to, uh, you know, find a, a way through the crisis that we've been in. And I, it's just so good to see the recovery uh, gaining momentum now. And uh, I, I think the, this year is going to be a good year for, for airlines. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Walsh, for speaking to us. Thank, Thank you. you.